Okay, so the next speaker is going to be Professor Warburton, who is going to speak to us about uh, excited states in quantum annealing, and uh, he's professor at UCLA. UCLA. <laughs> London, not California. Good, uh, thank you, Glenn, and uh, thank you to the conference organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, just confirm that I guess you can hear me at the back. Okay, thumbs are up, excellent, good. So, uh, yeah, my name is Paul Warburton. I'm at University College London, where I have a uh, small group working on both uh, experimental and theoretical aspects of uh, quantum annealing. Um, and today I'll be talking to you about uh, how we can exploit excited states in quantum annealing. This is work that has been sponsored by the agencies you can see on the screen here. Okay, so here's the uh, Hamiltonian that I guess everyone in the room is familiar with. And in the conventional approach of quantum annealing, you initialize the system in the ground state of the driver Hamiltonian. At the end, you read out the uh, ground state of the problem Hamiltonian in a computational basis. And the, the, the goal, I guess, of, of uh, adiabatic approaches is to stay in the instantaneous ground state at all times. For the purpose of today's presentation, we're going to get rid of these uh, three assumptions, uh, each in turn. So we don't initialize in the ground state necessarily, we don't read out in the ground state necessarily, and we don't stay in the ground state at all times during the anneal. Okay, so here's the format of my uh, presentation today. We're going to start with a couple of brief looks in sections one and two of uh, initializing in the excited state of the problem Hamiltonian. So this is what you might call reverse annealing. I'll speak very briefly about that. And then I'll move on to talk about uh, reading excited states at the end of the problem Hamiltonian, talk briefly about some experiments we did a few years ago now on uh, maximum entropy inference on the D-wave machine. And for the bulk of my talk, we'll be looking at section three, which is uh, the relaxation of staying in the ground state at all times. And that's a technique which has been increasingly popular over the last couple of years called diabatic quantum annealing. And I've got two, uh, two subsections of section three. First of all, we'll be looking at a, um, something we call the locally suppressed transverse field uh, method for diabatic quantum annealing, which is a heuristic which offers at least potential for speed up using existing superconducting device technology. And in the second part of section three, I'll be looking at using non-stochastic XX drivers as a way to give us the uh, potential structure during the anneal which could be exploited for diabatic quantum annealing. Okay, so first of all, uh, reverse annealing, which is all about initializing in an excited state of the problem Hamiltonian. I have very little to say about this other than to, uh, to include it for completeness, I guess. So, um, and there's been, uh, in the last few years, a number of quite impressive demonstrations of how you might use reverse annealing. Uh, on the left-hand side for computational problems, here's, here's some data uh, from uh, collaboration between NASA and Standard Chartered, where the uh, red data uh, shows a combination of a greedy algorithm and a forward anneal, and then reverse annealing to do a, um, a, a local exploration of states uh, near, near the final solution. And, uh, they see some, some uh, improvement in the performance. And on the right-hand side, there's been a lot of work recently from Andrew King and collaborators in um, quantum simulation using a reverse quantum annealing. And here's an example of a talk uh, uh, that I heard uh, in Telluride last week where, where Andrew King and colleagues were talking about um, uh, using reverse annealing for studying uh, magnetic monopoles. So it looks like a really powerful tool, um, and all I wanted to say today is just to draw your attention, if you're not aware of this, to some potential drawbacks of this reverse annealing technique. So first of all, uh, it requires clearly diabatic and or incoherent transitions, because if you're starting in an excited state, uh, you need to uh, transition out of that in some way, and that requires uh, diabatic or incoherent transitions, otherwise you just get back to where you started from in a reverse anneal. And secondly, um, uh, is really a warning that uh, certainly as implemented on the D-Wave machine, if not other implementations which may be available, um, there's some memory of your initial classical state which is imprinted uh, on, 
on, on, the, on the reverse anneal due to this phenomenon called spin bath polarization. So here's some data which my student, Daniel O'Connor, uh, has taken just to illustrate the point. Can I uh, get a marker, one second? Okay, so here on the right-hand side, we're um, initializing the uh, classical state either in up or down, depending on where, whether we're uh, blue or orange. And then we reverse anneal back to some value of S, the annealing parameter, and then go back again uh, without pausing and measure the classical state. And the point is that if we anneal back to a zero in the annealing parameter, we should completely erase memory of our initial classical state, and that's obviously not the case uh, in the experimental data. If we uh, uh, run the anneal an order of magnitude faster, we, we can minimize this effect, but we can't get rid of it. And so this is just a sort of caution, really, and I should point out, as, as Andrew King pointed out to me last week, there's a nice paper by uh, Trevor Lanting and colleagues which um, uh, analyzes this effect in detail and does at least suggest there are some regimes of operation where you can uh, effectively uh, beat the timescales of the spin bath polarization effect to uh, eliminate this effect. That's really just a health warning about doing reverse annealing, though it does seem to be a very powerful technique. Second thing I'm gonna talk about today is reading out uh, excited states at the end of the anneal, the excited states of the problem Hamiltonian. This is something I worked on a number of years ago with uh, Nick Chancellor, who is here, uh, and it's what we call maximum entropy inference. So we looked at uh, the inference problem, and the inference problem in a nutshell is you have some data, it's corrupted by noise in some way, and you want to uh, extract the original uncorrupted data from that noisy data set. And in very general ways, there are two ways of doing this. Uh, uh, there's maximum likelihood inference, in and that corresponds to um, looking at the ground state of the uh, 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 inferred information, and the ground state turns out to be um, the solution which uh, maximizes the likelihood of um, uh, getting the correct overall solution. But there's also maximum entropy inference, and in this case, you're looking at uh, distribution over excited states in order to maximize the entropy of the decoded information, uh, and that corresponds to getting the Boltzmann distribution over the excited states. And what we showed is that um, as long as you have some prior information about the noise distribution that's corrupting your data, uh, in certain instances, maximum entropy inference can outperform maximum likelihood inference. And we uh, published a paper in this citation at the top of the page here in red, uh, where we looked at decoding of classical error correcting codes as an example of a maximum uh, entropy inference on a quantum annealer. Uh, and there's lots of details in the paper, but the key result is here. So here we're plotting uh, on the y-axis the um, bitter error rate of our decoded information at some temperature T uh, as a function of the uh, ground state, uh, sorry, normalized with respect to the ground state uh, bit error rate, that's the maximum likelihood decoding. And we're plotting that on the x-axis as a function of the uh, Nishimori temperature, which is basically a measurement of the noise which is corrupting your data. In this case, this is the noise on a communication channel. Uh, and uh, so uh, if you look at the top right, we can see we've, we've sort of uh, used this usual um, uh, proxy for temperature by having a factor alpha in front of the magnitude of the problem Hamiltonian terms. And as we increase alpha, which is equivalent to decreasing the effective temperature, we can see that there are some regions of operation where this maximum entropy decoding outperforms the maximum likelihood decoding. Uh, and what that is saying is that uh, uh, on the D-Wave machine, that the excited states contain useful information about the problem you're trying to solve. And I should also point out there's reference to this uh, paper by the Los Alamos group where they're looking at um, using the D-Wave machine for, uh, for Gibbs or Boltzmann sampling from, uh, from Hamiltonian. So that's a very similar sort of uh, 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 a technique that these guys are using. Okay, so that's a very brief look at initializing your Hamiltonian in an excited state, and also at reading out at the end of the anneal uh, excited states in your Hamiltonian. Uh, and for the rest of the talk, I'm going to look at uh, diabatic quantum annealing. So this is 
uh, transitioning during your kneel through uh, excited states. And as I said, we have two techniques. And first of all, I'm going to talk about something we published uh, a few months ago now, which is this locally suppressed transverse field heuristic for diabetic quantum annealing. So there's been a bit of activity in the last few years on diabetic quantum annealing, uh, and you might think of that as basically a shortcut to adiabaticity. In other words, you have some small gap in your annealing schedule. If you want to stay in the ground state as you go through that schedule, of course, you have to go slow. So that's what we call quantum slowdown. Uh, if you can arrange, let's say, uh, a potential structure with two avoided crossings during the, the uh, anneal, there's a possibility of moving fast through both of those transitions, start in the ground state, go to an excited state during the anneal, and return to the ground state. So this gets rid of this speed limit for quantum annealing, for adiabatic quantum annealing. And this goes back, I guess, to 2012 in this paper by uh, Orlando Sommer and colleagues, where they showed there was a provable speed up, at least in an oracular setting, for this specific uh, permutation symmetric problem called the glued trees. Uh, more recently, Vicky Choi has uh, published a very nice paper on how you might use uh, XX interactions in your Hamiltonian in order to effectively engineer a structure which gives you the required, required avoided level crossings. And I should point out also that some of this is, is sort of in the same spirit as this proposal by uh, Elliot Caput and colleagues where uh, by applying RF fields during the anneal, you can effectively mix the ground state and the excited state effectively. So there's a lot of uh, published work, and I refer to this review here by uh, Elizabeth Cross on Daniel Lidar for more information. So uh, um, here's the basic idea. Here's a typical problem that we might look at. I'm showing the ground state as the dashed line, first excited state blue and second excited state orange. And we have two uh, small gaps, at least invisible at this scale, um, in between the ground state and the first excited state. So the idea is that by uh, annealing fast, you have these two Landau Zeno transitions, which uh, you start in the ground state and end in the ground state. OK, so the question is, how do we reliably, in inverted commas, create this additional gap min minimum uh, ideally using hardware that we have available to us today. And in this paper by uh, Louis Freiburio and colleagues, um, we uh, achieve this, at least heuristically, by creating this quasi-degeneracy in the spectrum at some value of time during the anneal, which we call Tx. Uh, and uh, the way we do that is by suppressing the transverse field on a single target qubit that's part of your problem. And then we pre-anneal the target qubit so that its longitudinal field at this, at this time, Tx, is zero. So let me just explain that with a cartoon or two. So here we've got a, a multiple qubit problem, but I'm only showing you in this particular graph the single qubit that we call the target qubit. So we have a, a longitudinal field ramp, for example, could be linear, and that's not critical. But the key point is the transverse field on the target qubit is zero throughout the anneal. So uh, for times less than Sx, we assume our, our target qubit is in the ground state, which I'm calling spin up. As I go through this point where the longitudinal field changes sign, because there is no transverse field, there's no mechanism for the target qubit to flip. So the target qubit stays in the spin up state, but now that's the first excited state. Then for the other qubits in the problem, we have, as shown in red here, a rather conventional anneal. It doesn't start until um, this uh, normalized annealing time Sx. So we turn down the transverse field on all the other qubits, and we turn up the longitudinal field. Uh, and in the examples I give, it's linear, but again, that's not critical, I don't think. OK, so how does this do? We've tried to uh, at least show the feasibility of this by uh, generating some random uh, examples. So we have uh, here's a specific example on seven qubits. And again, the details of all the parameters are shown. There are various local fields, and all the couplers are um, uh, ferromagnetic with half a gigahertz. So if we look at the uh, standard linear annealing schedule, we have this small gap at about 0.8 uh, S, uh, which is going to cause a problem. But if we do this uh, uh, suppressed transverse field approach, locally suppressed transverse field approach, and apply it just to qubit 1 in this case, which is our target qubit where this applied to, then we get this uh, second avoided level crossing 
uh, at um, s equals 0.2, which in principle at least might allow us to uh, exploit this DQA approach. So now we need to uh, generalize this. So we've looked at a bunch of different uh, seven qubit examples. Here are some technical details of that. So we have between um, six and 16 edges in our seven qubit problem. We uh, uh, assign randomly selected local fields from a Gaussian distribution. Then we rescale so the maximum local field is always one gigahertz. We study the closed system dynamics on the Q-tip, sort of Schrodinger solver. We set the anneal time to 100 nanoseconds. Um, of course, when we're doing this locally suppressed transverse field, we, we need to select one target qubit to be the qubit with the zero transverse field, and we have a choice of seven, so we basically do it seven times in this case and select the highest probability of the seven, uh, sorry, the, the highest ground state probability of the seven options that we choose. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's all the technical details. Okay, so here's some data. Uh, this is again simulation data and a closed system uh, dynamics on a Schrodinger solver, Q-tip specifically. And on the y-axis, we've got the ground state probability using this uh, longitudinally suppressed transverse field diabatic quantum annealing technique. And on the x-axis, we've got the ground state probability using a standard linear anneal. Uh, and uh, so we have seven qubits, and in this particular instance, we've got between six and eight edges of these randomly generated problems. I think there are 200 or so instances here plotted. And there's uh, various things uh, going on. Some of these problems have uh, large minimum gaps in the adiabatic approach. Some of them have small, as defined on the previous slide. Uh, but you can see this clustering of much, many of the instances. So let's look at the various different uh, possibilities. So first of all, looking at these guys down at the bottom of the graph, which I've circled in purple, this is kind of bad news for the uh, DQA technique where the, uh, using DQA, our ground state probability is zero or close to zero, where we had a finite probability with the standard linear anneal. So what's going on here, as shown in this uh, beautiful hand drawing up in the right-hand side, is that, so here I've plotted the ground state in red, first excited state in blue, second excited state in green as a function of the annealing parameter S. Uh, and what seems to be happening here is that with our diabatic quantum annealing technique, we are transitioning out of the um, <coughs> ground and first excited state uh, and ending up in the second excited state because of some uh, small crossing between the first excited state and the second excited state and or higher levels. So we end up in higher excited states in those particular instances. Next cluster to look at is these uh, problems that I've circled in blue where we seem to have a very similar probability of being in the ground state for the DQA technique and the standard adiabatic anneal. In these instances, we have a, a perturbative transition or a perturbative crossing, I should say, somewhere near the end of the anneal. That's something we commonly observe in this, in this field, uh, where um, uh, in, the in, the, in the DQA diabatic technique, we excite to the first excited state and then back to the um, uh, ground state so as we approach the end of the anneal where we, where we have this perturbative crossing, it doesn't really matter whether I'm using this linear anneal or the diabatic approach. So we get very similar uh, ground state probabilities uh, uh, because effectively we have uh, uh, an even number of uh, Landau, uh, sorry, I should say a total odd number of uh, landau zener transitions to or from the first excited state. So here there's no gain for the DQA technique. Uh, the final cluster of data is what you might call the good news for the DQA technique, where we have a very high probability using the DQA technique, uh, irrespective of what's going on. And that, in that case, we've engineered the, uh, the spectrum to do exactly what we want to do. In other words, we have an, uh, an even number of Landau transition, landau zener transitions between the ground state and the first excited state, so that we end up in the ground state at the end of the anneal, even though we may have this... Uh, 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 avoided crossing uh, in the adiabatic approach. So there's a complicated array of possible um, uh, transitions we might undergo, some of which are good news for DQA, some of which are not such good news. Uh, if we um, 
change the problem a little by adding more edges, we basically add more constraints, which, which uh, removes this um, low energy transition uh, towards the end of the anneal, or increases the, uh, the uh, gap in the problem Hamiltonian. Uh, and that seems to suggest that uh, we move to a regime as we increase the edges where the diabatic approach is more favorable. Uh, okay, so uh, we should also look at the uh, anneal time dependence. So this is, again, just uh, a single instance with seven qubits and eight edges where we're plotting the ground state probability as a function of the total annealing time. Uh, and if you do a linear anneal, here's the uh, diabatic bump, which you can get, which leads to high probabilities at very short annealing times. Uh, followed by um, this increase here as we approach the diabatic, uh, adiabatic limit. Excuse me. And you can see that for all anneal times, at least shown here, this uh, uh, locally suppressed transverse field approach gives you a higher ground state probability. If your preferred, preferred metric is time to solution, that's on the right hand side here. So here's the um, effectively the number of iterations you require to uh, achieve a probability of finding the ground state of 99% as a function of the total annealing time, and at least in the range of uh, timescales shown here for this particular problem, we see a couple of orders of magnitude improvement uh, for the, um, uh, for the uh, DQA technique. Uh, so all, all, all what I've said so far is in the closed system case for this DQA method, uh, we had a brief look at uh, open system dynamics as well. So here we restrict ourselves uh, to the two qubit case, um, and we're using this uh, adiabatic master equation technique using this nice uh, hoaxed uh, tool, which is available online, I believe. Um, and uh, we have, um, as a, here's the probability of the ground state using, again, just in a two qubit case, using one of these, uh, uh, we, we suppress the transverse field on one of the qubits. We're plotting that as a function of the anneal time in nanoseconds. And we have uh, two different types of system bath coupling independently on the two qubits, uh, one via sigma z and one via sigma x in orange and blue, respectively. Uh, if we have this dephasing uh, decoherence, uh, we get a result that's uh, negligibly different from the closed system case. But interestingly, as, as you might expect, uh, if you have uh, 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 um, uh, inelastic scattering coupling via this uh, sigma x term in the sigma system bath coupling uh, that effectively uh, promotes transitions between the first excited relaxation between the first excited and the state and the ground state which means that you can end up in the wrong state at the end of the anneal in other words that because of this uh, sigma x system bath coupling you have relaxation from the first excited state to the ground state after the first uh, level crossing and so you end up in the first excited state at the end uh, and furthermore, if you look at the details uh, in the paper here, uh, what we've shown is that um, uh, you can generalize this to a larger number of qubits. And it's always uh, the relaxation of your target qubit that dominates um, uh, this uh, suppression of the ground state probability in the, DQ, in the locally suppressed transverse field DQA technique. So that, we think, gives you a potential for studying the role of coherence in this DQA technique, and furthermore, you can extend it to a multiple qubit uh, system and look at uh, the uh, uh, decoherence effects qubit by qubit, if you like. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about this uh, locally suppressed transverse field heuristic. Uh, one thing in which I, perhaps I should point out is, of course, in this, in this method, we're only using the standard X Z and ZZ interactions that are available uh, on the D-Wave machine. What I'm going to talk about now, uh, largely inspired by work which was done by Vicky Choi, is looking at how we might use a non-stochastic XX driver for implementing the sort of uh, schedules that are required for diabatic quantum annealing. Okay, so uh, this is work which is done by my student Natasha Feinstein, who is uh, in the room. Um, and she's been looking at uh, uh, Hamiltonians with perturbative crossings and thinking about what happens as you add a catalyst term to the Hamiltonian. So just uh, for reference, 
Uh, we have, a, as a function of time, we have a problem Hamiltonian in, in the computational basis, which increases. We have a driver Hamiltonian, which is this uh, local X field, which decreases. And to this, we add in green this catalyst term, which comes on during the kneel and goes away again uh, in, in this form. A particular catalyst we've been looking at is uh, XX catalysts. And Natasha will be giving a talk at this conference on Thursday and will tell you uh, much more about this in the stochastic and non-stochastic cases. I'm just going to look only at the non-stochastic case and the effect it has on diabetic quantum annealing. And again, inspired by the work that Vicky Choi has done, we're going to look at the effect of these drivers on the weighted maximum independent set problem. So I'll talk a bit about the problem where uh, we have um, this bipartite graph where we're looking to uh, create uh, an independent set, i.e. Uh, a set where no members of that set are directly coupled by the black lines. And we give each uh, variable a weight and we want to maximize the weight within the set. So, you know, the obvious solution here in this particular example is a set containing the two blue variables, which is independent because there's no direct coupling between the two blue variables and that has a weight of four. And in particular, the ground state is shown here. So we're going to use a spin up to encode the uh, variables which are in the identified set and spin down for the other ones. So in this particular example, there's a ground state, which is these two blues. And the first excited state is these three oranges. So just a reminder, the spin up encodes uh, the identified set uh, of the maximum independent set. Uh, following, again, the approach of Vicky Choi, we need to in introduce the concept of neighbors. Um, so uh, neighbors are those um, uh, states which are directly coupled to, for example, the ground state by the uh, X terms in the uh, driver Hamiltonian. So an example, if you look at the ground state of this um, maximum independent set problem, we have these two spin-ups here, and the neighbors uh, consist of either flipping a spin within the set, and there's some two of these, for example, this one here, or flipping one of the uh, spins which is outside of the set, in which case we have uh, this threefold uh, uh, symmetry here, um, and, uh, you know, clearly in this case, we no longer have an independent set because we have direct couplings between members of this set. So this is an excited state, but it's a neighbor of the ground state. And similarly, one can define neighbors of the first excited state. We need to make this a hard problem in some sense. So we have a tunable hardness parameter, which is basically set by the weights. So if we... Um, uh, have this parameter delta W and make it small enough, we can find the weights of the blue set and the orange set are rather similar, and that basically makes the problem harder, as you might expect. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, uh, so we have a tunable hardness parameter. We also need some method of scaling to uh, larger problem sizes, which is shown on the right-hand side, where we have a, a, a generalized n-qubit problem where we scale the weights according to the expressions you can see here. Um, so that defines our problem. Let's look at what happens uh, in the annealing case if we don't have a catalyst. So in other words, we just have a uniform uh, X driver, local X driver. And here uh, we're looking at a phi spin problem where we have uh, delta W is very small, which makes the problem hard. And we have this um, nasty looking avoided level crossing. So here I'm plotting uh, in blue the overlap between the instantaneous ground state and the problem ground state. In orange, the overlap between the instantaneous uh, ground state and the problem first excited state. Uh, and in the gray uh, plots you can see in the background here, uh, the overlap between the instantaneous ground state and all the other states um, that we have uh, in the system. Plotting as a function of annealing time. And you can see that uh, basically the system has a strong overlap with the first excited state until we get to this uh, avoided level crossing here towards the end of the anneal and then we have uh, what I might loosely describe as a phase transition, uh, although not in the thermodynamic limit here, of course, uh, where we have a sudden transition of weight to the uh, ground state at the end of the anneal. And getting the system through this is what causes the problem hardness. 
So that's what happens. Uh, again, this is a closed system where we're just doing exact diagonalization because it's a nice small system. That's what happens when we have a uniform X driver with no catalyst. Uh, and as we scale this to a larger system size, we plot here the minimum gap between the ground state and the first excited state as a function of system size, and we have an exponential suppression of the gap, so this is a, a nasty looking problem as we scale up to bigger sizes. Okay, so what happens is we add a single non-stochastic XX coupler as a catalyst. So we're gonna put the XX coupler uh, in this location between the um, two of the uh, spins that are not in the uh, maximum weight independent set, and effectively that creates new neighbors. So because we can now flip two spins simultaneously via this XX driver, we now have new neighbors to the ground state. So our, ground, our new neighbors for the ground state consist of flipping uh, these two spins here. That gives us again a non-independent set as shown by the green uh, line here. And we also have a new neighbor for the first excited state where we flip these two spins which give us an, uh, an apparent independent set, which again is not the ground state shown here. And the real question is, what effect does the uh, presence of these neighbors have on the state spectrum during the anneal? Okay, quite a lot going on in this slide, so we'll start in the top left. This is the gap between the ground state and the first excited state as a function of the strength of this non-stochastic catalyst. Again, it's a single non-stochastic catalyst shown here. Um, and uh, first thing we see is it's uh, non-monotonic. So as you start increasing the catalyst, it looks like bad news. The gap size decreases, and then the gap size starts increasing and then goes down again. And I guess, I um, uh, hope I'm not saying this incorrectly, Natasha will talk more about the effect of these catalysts on the uh, gap size uh, on Thursday. Uh, and of course, I should point out that uh, there's this uh, paper by uh, Elizabeth Crosson and colleagues where they've looked at uh, the effect of XX catalysts uh, on general problems, and I guess this is consistent with that work. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't, and in general, as, as Elizabeth showed in that paper, the addition of the XX cap, uh, catalyst does not help. And if you look at the, um, okay, so now we say, well, maybe we can make the best of this by sitting at this point here, which is the optimum catalyst strength. And here we're plotting the magnitude of the, opt of the uh, 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 gap between the ground and first excited states in the two cases where you have no catalyst in black and the optimized catalyst strength, in other words, finding this maximum, as a function of the system size. And you do see some small increase in the gap, but again, the scaling looks pretty bad. Uh, one good thing to come from this is at least apparently with the sizes of systems we're looking at so far, is the optimum value of this uh, catalyst strength the single XX non-stochastic coupler um, does seem to saturate at high values of N, suggesting that, um, uh, you know, in, in general, if you have a large problem of this kind, you can just dial up that value of catalyst and you may get some improvement. And we're, we're currently looking at extending this to larger system sizes uh, right now. So the scaling of the uh, gap minimum doesn't look too healthy, um, but we notice something else going on. Uh, which in the context of diabetic quantum annealing could be exploitable. So here we're looking at the uh, ground state along the bottom and plotting the first excited state uh, here uh, during the anneal as we increase the catalyst strength from left to right uh, in this uh, system uh, shown on the left here. Uh, and we can see there's a clear appearance of this second gap at some critical value of the uh, catalyst strength. And the second uh, minimum gap, at least, might be exploitable for diabetic quantum annealing. So where is this second gap coming from? Well, it's certainly related to the non-stochasticity in some sense. So the, the, one of the key features of non-stochasticity, of course, is that you can have negative amplitudes on the ground state, and that seems to be what's going on here. At this value of the uh, XX interaction which gives us this uh, minimum in this uh, additional gap that's appearing. The state spectrum is shown on the right-hand side. And again, the blue line is the weight of the instantaneous uh, ground state on the problem ground state. 
and there is a uh, sign transition. I've left off a uh, crucial zero on the, on the uh, axis here, but this is the zero. And there is a sign transition as you go through this first avoided level crossing here in the uh, weight on the ground state. Uh, and so this, this, you know, the, 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 the negativity of this weight, which is only a, a, a open to you in non-stochastic uh, Hamiltonians, seem to be playing a key role in giving us this uh, second avoided level crossing. Okay, I think I've been um, reasonably uh, conservative on time. So I'll reach my conclusions. Uh, I've shown in various different contexts that you can, you can uh, relax your adherence to the ground state uh, in, in many applications in various different ways. Uh, I've shown uh, briefly, at least at the start of this presentation, that uh, excited states, certainly on the D-wave machine, can contain useful information about the problem you're trying to solve, and we showed that in the context of maximum, ent maximum entropy inference. Uh, and in terms of diabatic quantum annealing, uh, we've come up with um, two methods of doing that. So the first method was by suppressing the transverse field on a single qubit. This seems to be a heuristic method, but it's certainly a heuristic method, which might give you performance improvement some of the time. And the question is, how do we generalize that? I mean, that's always the question in terms of this diabatic quantum annealing. Given accessible information about the problem you're trying to solve, how do you engineer your driver and your catalyst in a way which which gives you the required um, state transitions. That, I guess, is the million-dollar question for uh, DQA. And what we've shown is there are some hints of how you might do that, at least in the context of this weighted maximum independent set program uh, problem using a uh, non-stochastic XX driver. So I should acknowledge the people who did the most of the work I've spoken about today, Nick Chancellor, who did this maximum entropy stuff, uh, Louis Fry Burio, who uh, did the uh, suppressed transverse field approach, Natasha Feinstein, who did the XX coupling and will be speaking on Thursday, and Daniel O'Connor, who did the reverse annealing. Thanks to Alas Alamos on the ISI for giving us access to the D-Wave machine, uh, and these people along the bottom did the funding. Uh, and finally, I might abuse my time here by giving an advertisement for this new international network on quantum annealing. So this is funded by the United Kingdom uh, EPSRC funding agency, part of the UK government. And it's really part of the Brexit agenda, if I'm honest, about giving scientists mechanisms for reaching, scientists in the UK, mechanisms for reaching out to the rest of the world. We're still open for business in uh, science in the UK, and this international network on quantum annealing gives us an opportunity to do so. Uh, so what we'll be doing is having a uh, weekly online seminars. In fact, we're starting fortnightly to ramp up, and we hope to go weekly uh, in the fall semester. Those will start on Tuesday, July the 12th. We'll have uh, funding for exchange visits if you want to uh, make an international exchange trip, and we'll have an annual conference penciled in currently for November this year. And the network really brings together the existing international collaborations that we have in quantum annealing in the Americas, in Europe, in the UK, and in Japan. So if you'd like to get involved, and I would certainly encourage you to get involved if you're interested, uh, I um, suggest you uh, go to this website or take a picture of the QR code. That's technology that's beyond me. Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, uh, interacting with you through Inca. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for this talk. Uh, I think we can proceed with the questions. So, yes. So, uh, thanks. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, so, quick question. Uh, I saw that for your XX you know, it was spatially localized. So do you think that this is a critical aspect of, uh, you know, utilizing non-stochasticity that you kind of have to, you know, restrict it to certain uh, I's and J's? And then um, second question is, have you studied this, uh, this in a reverse anneal? I know early in the talk you talked about reverse and now this, and uh, I think that it potentially could shine in that context. And so I was curious whether you've looked at it. Okay, yes, yeah. so, so you're correct in saying that this, this uh, XX um, 
uh, driver that we're adding is local. We apply it to just a single pair of qubits. Uh, and that, that we find interesting, because it seems to, as I pointed out earlier on, scale to much, much larger systems, which um, is perhaps a little surprising that, um, that you just, you know, uh, tickle, if you like, two qubits in your entire multi-qubit system, and it has this radical effect on, on uh, the dynamics. I guess in that sense, it's not so very different from the first approach I mentioned, where we really just change the field on a single qubit. So uh, whether that is uh, essential for getting these DQA transitions, I don't know, I think is the honest answer. I mean, you know, essentially, I, I'm, 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 I'm resorting to conjecture now. So everything I say comes with that health warning. Um, you might believe that the argument goes something like the following. The, you're, you're adding a single additional avoided level crossing when you're trying to create this pair of avoided level crossings. You have one already, you want one more. And to do that, you might believe that you just need to affect a single thing. I mean, that's slightly hand-waving, but it seems believable. Uh, second question you had was about reverse annealing. No, we, we haven't looked at that yet. That's an interesting suggestion, one that uh, perhaps we can think about and discuss. Thanks, David. I actually have a question. Can I ask? Yeah, go ahead, Adisa. Um, so um, there was um, so there was this mini gap and there was the second mini gap, and I did not really understand how come the system's energy is drastically reducing to the ground state, like those uh, blue or orange curves. That was one of the curves was on the last to last slide. No, this one. Yes, as well, this one. Uh, so I don't quite know what your question is. What, now I have this slide. Uh, so, so, the, uh, so whenever you're taking this, uh, this um, inner product between this E0S and E1S and E0S with E0S, whenever there is this first, is like this first mini gap and there is the second mini gap and there is this drastic fall, uh, so how is the, these things are happening in this orange curve and in this blue curve? Okay, well, let me, perhaps I can just explain it in the, in the more straightforward case uh, here. Yeah. So, so this, is, this is, if you like, um, I mean, imagine extending this to the thermodynamic limit. This is, this is a quantum phase transition. Uh, yeah. And... Uh, uh, as you know, when you transition from one equilibrium to another equilibrium, your fluctuations are maximized. And this is an example of this. You have a very strong fluctuation from the ground state to the first excited state. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, but uh, for the orange line, there is uh, this, uh, but the orange line is actually, so the one that is actually an excited state, it is actually, so this uh, inner product is actually falling. So this is also a result of this quantum phase transition. Yeah, so you're, you're, you're transitioning weight from the first excited state to the ground state. And the, the system not, must do that somewhere because there's a lot of weight in the first excited state um, to the left of this transition. And we know, mm. at least in closed system dynamics, that you must end up in the ground state mm -hmm. by the adiabatic theorem. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, things have to change rapidly. This is what makes the problem hard. So, for example, if my problem, or say artificially, somehow I create many, many, many gaps, and uh, there is a quantum phase transition at every mini gap. I mean, it generally happens. Um, so, uh, after, so what we have observed in our problem that after the very small exponential mini gap, the system actually transitions to a localized state. That is this many-body localization state. And after that, after you have this, the only phase transition that one can have is only many body phase transition. So from transition from one localized state to another localized state. Or, or are you, are you uh, transitioning from many body localized to delocalized state in the subsequent mini gaps? Yeah, I haven't thought about this in the context of many body localization, I have to be honest with you. But that sounds like an interesting discussion, uh, something for us to think about. Okay. 
Okay, so yes. maybe we can sit, uh, sit uh, yeah. with my supervisor, Dimitri, sometimes during okay. the conference. Sounds good. Yes, maybe you guys can continue later. Thank you. Yes. Hi, actually, I'm Dmitry Bagrets, yeah. Let I touch you, try to touch you further. So these mini gaps <laughs> which appear in the end of the spectrum, yeah, they typically happen with the states which have a yeah, huge humming distance, actually, of the order of system size. Now the question to this diabetic type of annealing, is it, do you have some understanding if it works then it works only when by chance you have the states which were close in humming distance. And that's why by acting on a single qubit, you were able to somehow resolve your problem. And these cases which didn't work, they actually correspond to the situation when they were far away and your approach was unsuccessful. So I'm, I'm now trying to outline pessimistic picture or you are more optimist that just by acting on a single qubit, you will be able to also yeah, crack this problem when they are very far away. Do you, did you did this analysis for your random instances when it works so and when it not? The, the, yeah, the short answer this. is no, we have not looked at uh, the Hamming weight uh, during these processes, and that's an interesting suggestion or something. Yeah, because I think we should in, do. in in BL phase, yeah, they're very far away. Yeah, and this is yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Uh, so, so if we have single X drivers and only X X drivers, then anything that's having weight three away will cause problems. So, so that's an interesting suggestion. Yeah, thanks. Hello? Okay. Um, could you please again show the other plot like that where you had the two crossings? Yeah. Um, could it be that the first, like, did you look at the, uh, at the wave functions at the first crossing? Could it be that they're, like, bimodal in that regime? And that basically this, this transition occurs when, in the ground state, the, the sign flips between those two modes in the, in the wave function. I, I mean, sign flips are, are playing a key role. Again, let me just reiterate that this is the origin, which I forgot to label. Um, so, so, yes, I agree with you. Uh, I don't quite know what you mean by bimodal, I guess. As in it's, uh, mm, yeah, the local has more or less in two locations, basically, and the wave function is one case, one mode plus the other mode, and then you have one other state that's one oh. mode minus the other mode. And that those those type of states tend to be very close in, in energy. And there there are, there are there are other states going on in grey in the background here. So it's not not as if we have no weight on 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 other problem states. Okay, so those are all the yeah, uh, these, these the grey lines. Of all, sorry, yeah. oh, then how do I read those grey lines then? The grey lines are the uh, weights of the instantaneous ground state on the problem second, third, fourth excited state. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so in, in order for a DQA to succeed, um, not only do we want to have the second uh, minimum gap appear, but we also need to maintain a large gap to higher excited states, as indeed you showed in uh, the suppressed transverse field case. Yeah. So um, what, what is the situation in regards to that issue with uh, the XX uh, story here? Uh, so, I mean, as yet, we haven't done any dynamical modeling of the process, uh, which is computationally intensive, but we shall try and do it. So, so I guess I don't have an answer for that specific question. I agree with your general observation that o only looking at the first excited state is, is perhaps uh, overly simplistic, but um, uh, yeah, agreed, agreed. But is, is the, um, the formalism uh, that you're relying on, so uh, the work by Vicky Choi uh, and, and what you've done here, does it give us insight into uh, the gap to the second excited state? I don't think that it does, but that's, that's I agree, a key question. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, and a, another related question to this. So um, you are arguing convincingly that the non-stochastic uh, term is responsible for the, the sign change and the overlap. But what happens if you change the xx to a negative xx? Um, have you checked that? Does it, does it actually fail to, to help? Uh, yeah, so, so, and again, Natasha will speak in much more detail about this on Thursday. So we looked at the st stochastic version of this, which does give you um, a, a gap enhancement on certain regimes. But so far, at least, uh, in our exploration of this particular problem, we, we don't see this appearance of the um, additional minimal gap. I see, because the argument that you, um, that you made uh, relies on, on this picture with the sign flip of the, yeah. the overlap, but it also relied on, um, I think it was one of the previous slides, um, where you introduced two neighbor, new neighbors uh, due to the double uh, flipping, uh, so you change the Hamming weight uh, by two instead of just by one. Yeah. And that also played an important role, and that would not be dependent on having non-stochastic XX, it would also work with a stochastic XX. So, so we've looked at, uh, let me see if I can remember this. There are four possible things you can do. You can add a new neighbor to the ground state of the first excited state, uh, or you'll do that, and you can, uh, um, either the ground state is, is lower in energy, in which case it'll dominate, or the first excited state is lower in energy. I mean, the new neighbor to the ground state, or the new neighbor to the first excited state is lower in energy, in which case it dominates the effect. And you can, so that's two things you can do, and you can do that either with uh, positive XX or negative XX. Uh, and the one, uh, let's hope I state this correctly, the, the, the one of those four possibilities that give us this second avoided crossing, at least as far as we've seen so far, with this particular problem, is the uh, non-stochastic uh, uh, interaction applied to the uh, first excited state uh, of the maximum independent set problem. So other possibilities did not give us the second avoided level crossing. Oh, Natasha nodding, I'm glad to see that, good. <laughs> Are there other questions? Okay, if not, we can thank Paul for the talk again. Thank you, Glenn.